our nation. Pray for the lost. Pray for our leaders, our president, and the, the ones making decisions for us. Can um, you pray for our church and our, our ministries here and finances, uh, the growth? Pray for Kay and myself as we, uh, we try to lead as the, the Lord would have us to. Then I uh, ask you to pray for Brenda Daniels. Uh, this is Brother Barry Daniels' mom. Uh, she's at home now. Burnett neighbors, continue to pray for him. How's he doing, Dave? Doing good. All right. Pretty good. He's doing better. Uh, yeah, actually, he's doing real good. Okay. Continue to pray for him. Uh, Brianna, continue to pray for her. Uh, Lenny Smith, uh, still at French. Sheila and Kayla Nestor, continue to pray for them. Pray for Doug Brown tomorrow, who will be having some surgery done uh, tomorrow sometime during the day, so pray for him. Josh Williamson, uh, recovering from a heart transplant, doing well. Uh, Jessica Cook, recovering from a stroke. Uh, Thomas Fouts, um, we had him down for health issues, but he's actually in the hospital, Brother Jerry, to tell me, so pray for him. church family that's uh, got more out than we do in. Mm -hmm. Jessica and her family, Virginia and Melissa. Mm -hmm. so, uh, just, uh, just pray for all of them. Take your stand your prayers. And then pray for Jerry Landrum. Is there anything on the same on a ventilator? He's uh, in, in, in a coma state uh, with COVID. Anybody else have a prayer request? That's my mom. She's having a lot of troubles. Then it's Lewis. Then it's... I guess I'm going to have to work some of the little bit. I don't like my toes. First off, it's a blood clot. Sugar drop. Pray, pray, pray for these. Uh, pray for all those kids. Uh, Pete, Chris, friend prayer. He gets back to the doctor with his head on the 1st of June. All right. Pray for Christopher on the 1st of June. 
pray for uh, pray for our camp week coming up. Uh, we'll be here before we know it. So keep all the all the workers and all the all the kids that'll be going in, in your prayers. Pray that everything will go smoothly. So let's uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord and Lord, for uh, all the things that you do. And we just ask now that you be with us as we go into your service, Lord. And we pray for all of those that's been uh, lifted up to you tonight, Lord. We just uh, uh, in our prayer request, we pray for all those that are on our prayer list, Lord. Uh, so many uh, people in need of, uh, of a touch from you, Lord. And we just pray for. Uh, my family, as they'll be traveling back on Saturday, I just pray that you would uh, give them travel and mercy as they, uh, they come back, keep them safe while they're there. And Lord, I pray for our service coming up on Sunday, our Memorial Day service, Lord. I just pray that uh, your will will be done there. Pray for Brother Mike tonight as he uh, brings your word, and I uh, just pray that uh, he'll give us what, uh, what you've given him, and uh, we pray for him as he uh, strives to do your will your work and your ministry, Lord. And we'll give you all the honor for everything that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, for our announcements, uh, Preston, go out there and round up all the kids. It's only going to be like that. Okay. Uh, for our announcements, don't forget Sunday. Uh, Sunday school at 10 o'clock. If you can be here, Please come out for Sunday school. It's very important uh, part of uh, our ministry, and it's uh, very important to you, whether you think it is or not. Sunday school is very important. It's a time that you can, you can ask questions when you don't understand things and uh, you learn. So it's, it's a very important time for you to be here. Uh, be here um, for Sunday school at 10, worship service at 11, and we'll be doing the Lord's Supper uh, right after the message. And then June the 12th, uh, for you guys that will be going to the camp as workers, uh, I need to meet with you here at 10 o'clock. I've already notified the uh, other churches that uh, they've got workers coming that will be here with us. And uh, we'll go over some things. I'll be in touch with, uh, with the uh, camp director this coming up week and find out if anything has changed. As far as our requirements of what we got to do or, or anything like that. So, looking forward to camp. And then tomorrow is Mr. Jerry's birthday. Happy birthday, Jerry. He'll be 39, he says. So, I'm not going to stand too close to him, but. Uh, <laughs> to five one sixty four and we'll sing one more. One more.
have our youth in tonight. Uh, our youth will be in Sunday morning for a Memorial Day service. Uh, I've asked them to sit with their parents. I ask you that you stay in your seats, that you don't get up and walk around. And, uh, We're going to use the bathroom. If it's an emergency, you feel free to go. But uh, we, want, uh, we want everybody to stay in their seats. If, uh, when people get up and start moving around, and it pulls away from whoever's speaking and uh, um, takes their mind off of what they're doing. So uh, please, don't be up moving around. Um, Preston, how about coming and take our offer up for us this evening? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for everything that you do for us. And Lord, we just, uh, as we uh, take up our offering tonight, Lord, we pray for the one that has to give and the one that doesn't. We pray for, that everything that's brought in will be used for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Sarah to make her way. She's going to sing for us. I would like to, uh, I'll probably announce uh, this on Sunday morning as well. But, uh, good day to the people here. Folks, if you see something broke around here, please let me know. Don't let me find it on my own or, or just leave it hanging. Uh, if you break it, it's fine. You know, we'll, we'll get it fixed. I just need to know it. Been several different issues in the last month or so, and they're starting to, to pile up and getting costly. So, if you see things, or if you do something out of an accident or whatever, and don't think pastors going to jump all over you, just come and tell me. That way, we can get it taken care of. It. Okay? Like I said, I'm not, I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody, or I'm just putting it out there. All right. What do you need? You need a mic or? Uh, you don't know yet. You're nervous. You've done this enough time to be nervous. What's that mic?
you're a pastor, you don't like giving up your pulpit. And, uh, but this week has been, I mean, this month has been a blessing being able to hear uh, other pastors and take in uh, what they say. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll ask uh, different ones to, to preach or to sing in your church and stuff. And they, uh, well, let me check this, let me check that. Mike is, uh, every time I've ever asked him to speak here, is okay, I'll be there. I'll be there. If you need me, I'll be there. And, and uh, I appreciate my friendship with Brother Mike. I appreciate all he does. He does a lot of camp. He does a lot of camp and stuff. And, uh, considering a close brother in Christ. So, uh, if you come tonight and give us what the Lord has given you. Bible tonight, turn to Exodus 12. Baptist Church once again. Um, now for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Austin, and uh, my wife Jennifer, right here, raise your hand, honey. <laughs> my best friend, my soulmate, God to get to, and our daughter Bella, and Christopher. <laughs> He's like, yep. <laughs> He's with anybody. And um, been saved since 1991. Glory. And uh, called to preach back in 2015, and uh, just try to be obedient to God and uh, serve where He wants me to serve, and uh, let Him open doors where He wants to go. And uh, good to be here tonight. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we listen to reading His Word tonight, Father God, we come to Your throne of grace tonight, Lord, and we just want to just settle down. With the Georgia's rendition, this young lady's song. I've never heard that rendition of that song before. And uh, God, I just uh, praise you for her and her talent. That she's just able to get up here and just sing like that, Lord. And, and she's giving you the glory and praise for it, Lord. And just ask you to just uh, give her strength and continue to always sing for you, Lord. And never give up that talent, Father. And, and, and Father, everybody here tonight. Lord, just, uh, be with them, God, and direct us all tonight as we hear your word. Keep the devil away from us. Keep our cares away from whatever we might be worried about tonight. Just let us lay them at the foot of Jesus tonight, Lord. God, we ask you to lift me up tonight. Cross, Lord. I don't want the people to hear my thoughts, and I want them to hear your words through me tonight, your inspiration, not mine. Lord, your thoughts, not mine. God, we just ask you to give me the of what to say in scriptures and things, Lord, and, um, 
ask Saul to be dependent tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of the month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to, unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the, on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the cupids thereof. And, where, and ye shall not, not let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat, ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all of the firstborn. In the land of Egypt, both man, beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses. There ye shall, ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. What a wonderful hymn that is. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, in this day, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it. Feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it feast by an ordinance forever. All right, set the context of that scripture. Context of that scripture. Everybody knows the story of the Exodus. Everybody knows the story of the Israelites in slavery in Egypt. They were there 400 years, cried unto God, free them. And we know the story of Moses set in a basket as a baby, set off into the reeds, raised by Pharaoh, and became 40 years old. He murdered a, a, a fellow Egyptian and ran away from that, from the crimes, and ended up in the wilderness and found the burning bush, married and found the burning bush, and met God. Probably getting ready to <laughs> nervous as I am, but uh, God in, in, God had an encounter with Moses. Told him what he was going to do. He told him he was going to send ten plagues to Egypt to set the uh, and harden the heart of Pharaoh. And all these plagues hit. You can, uh, I don't. I can't remember all the plagues. It was from lice to um, killing cattle. And, and if you go and look at it. I looked at an interesting commentary from J. Vernon McGee through the Bible. He described each one of these plagues was a, a counterattack against Egypt's gods. And, and God said, and the Lord's word said it right here, he wanted to execute in, 13, in 12 both man and beast and against all gods of Egypt. And to this day, they don't have no gods to worship. They're like a Muslim country. It's like desolate over there. All right, coming back to the context of the scripture here, he was telling them, I'm getting ready to send the final plague. I'm getting ready to send the death blow to Egypt. I'm going to kill their firstborn. I want you to be ready. I want you to kill this sacrifice. I want you to take the blood and put it over your put it over your, your mantle, your post, and your door. So when I come, come through, the, the destroyer comes through. The Bible says the destroyer will come through. 
and kill the firstborn in Egypt. The destroyer. Not death angel, like we've heard, but the Bible said destroyer. What God has described here to keep the Passover, he described the Passover. And to this day, Jewish religion, they keep that Passover year. And God told them to pass this on to generation after generation after generation after generation. To let them remember this day. I am getting ready to set you free out of Egypt. No more slavery. And the thing is, when God set them out, and he told them, remember the last few scriptures here, he told them to keep the beat ready, have your shoes ready, have your clothes on, have your food and sack ready, unleavened bread in the bowl ready. And because what happened, when the, death, when the destroyer came through, killed all the firstborn of Egypt, Pharaoh got Moses and Aaron in the middle of the night and said, get out. Get out of my sight. Take your Israelites. Take everything and go. And if you read, continue on with that story, the Israelites plundered Egypt. They got to take the silver. They got to take the gold. It's like they, they plundered everything, all the riches of Egypt. It's like they, some of them were, they, they were just taking everything they got. And Egypt was like, here, get out of my sight here. You need, you need this extra bowl to take this stuff? Here, take this bowl. You need this donkey to help carry that? Look like you need help with that donkey. Here, take my donkey. Just, just go. We don't want to see you no more. Go, go. God wanted the Israelites to always remember what he did for them. And we know the story. God leads them out in the great exodus. God provided a pillar of fire by night to guide them and keep them warm in the desert. Because out in the desert, it gets pretty chilly at night. And then in the daytime, he provided them cloud to give them shade, to keep them from getting sunburned. Then he comes to the Red Sea, all blocked up. And what did they do? Complain to Moses. You let us out here in the Red Sea for us to die. We were better off in Egypt making bread. They need revitalized. God was, is trying, was trying, in, these, in this book of Exodus, he is revitalizing his people. Mike told me that the, the, the whole month of May is revitalization services. Revitalization month. I looked that up. Revitalization is the action of imbrewing. We're going to come back to that word. Something with new life and vitality. All right, the word in brewing, I looked that up. It means to permeate or influence as if by dying. It's not dying as death. This is dying as like tie-dye shirts or dying something. Dying or tinge or die deeply to provide something freely or naturally. All right, insert that meaning of embrewing with the meaning of revitalization. Revitalization is the action of permeating or influencing as if by dying or tinge or die deeply to provide something freely or naturally something with new life or vitality. As God was trying to revitalize the Israelites, why was he trying to get them out? Because he was his chosen people. But as you read the story in Exodus and keep going on, God do something for them, they would complain again. After he delivered them through the Red Sea, killed all, all the Egyptians that followed them, Pharaoh's army, they all died in the Red Sea that drowned them. Remember when God parted, parted, parted the sea for them? They walked through dry land. Walked through dry land, that miracle. Stop right there for a second. I come across an article. 47% of millennials do not believe there is a God and don't care to believe in God. 47% of millennials. Who's in the category of millennials? Karen. 
Folks, you young people are part of the millennial generation. 47% of millennials care less about God. Church of America has dropped the ball. <laughs> not only here, not only new life, not only charity, not only Providence, not only Henry, Roanoke, South Baptist, new, new life up the road, we have all that claim Christianity have dropped the ball. How can we sit back and blindly let 47% of millennial young people care less about God? Yes, I know it's demographics. I know it's cultural. I know it's different cultures out here that it's been generational, been a generation before that, 47%. What about the generation before? It might have been 35%. Before that, it might have been 31%. Where did it start? 60s, they took the Bible out of school, took prayer out of school. 73, in 1973, they legalized abortion. We'd butcher babies every day by the thousands and could care less. We have let the government redefine our young people. You don't want to be a girl? Fine, be a boy. You don't want to be a boy today? You can be a cat. Or you can be a donkey. You don't want to be a boy? You can be a girl. We have let the government tell our children in our schools that we send our children to what they want to be. Way I look at it, God designed your plumbing, that's what you are. We have let government, culture, we've let culture tell us man can marry a man, woman can marry a woman. But my God tells me that the definition of marriage is between one man and one woman. No government has to tell me a new definition. I know the original definition. I know that's not popular. I know people are going to hate my guts for that. But so be it. I'm standing on the word of God. Amen. We have got to revitalize ourselves. Just like God had to revitalize his children of Israel. Had to get them out of slavery. They had a slave mind mentality. They didn't know they were children of God. They didn't know they were cherished in their apple of his eye. All they seen, they made brick, made mud, made brick every day, built cities for the Pharaoh and all those construction people. They worked under the thumb of the tyrants and Pharaoh. That's all they knew. That's all they knew was making mud. 400 years of bondage. Generations after generations after generations grew up in the bondage of Egypt. Babies start to come in, being born. All they see is their mama holding them around, toting, toting, toting mud, toting brick, toting straw to make brick. And that's all they may be seeing. That's all their kids are seeing. So they grow up as adults, making brick. God, in the wilderness, took them into the wilderness for 40 years to reprogram his people. He had to reprogram his people to get the slave mentality out of his people. Just like Jesus Christ done, God came here, died on a cross for you. Died on a cross for mankind, became the redemption of all our sins, and died, raised himself from the dead three days later, defeated death, defeated the grave, defeated Satan. He's revitalized your heart through Jesus. He's provided a sufficient sacrifice. God, when you get saved, God doesn't see you Christians, a newborn Christian. He don't see you as sinful. He sees you through the eyes of his Savior, his Son. He sees us through the eyes of Jesus. God, we have forgotten, we have downgraded God Almighty from his throne 
to a lower class, just a loving, weepy God. God is holy. We have forgotten how holy God is. Jesus in Isaiah 53, he was beaten. He was punished. He was grinding like powder on the, on the cross. God couldn't look at it because all the sin was cast out on Jesus. He couldn't even look at his own son. Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had to turn his back on sin, his own son. He became the cupbearer for our sin. He became the revitalization of mankind. And we have failed to pass that on generation to generation to generation. Pass it on to our children. Our children see how we live. They see how we live not only in these pews. They see us how we live at home. They see us how we live when we lose our temper. They see how we live when we get aggravated. They see how we live when a, when a big bill comes in to see if we get aggravated or worried about it or not. We let our light shine for Christ. Hide it under a bushel, no? Remember the song? Our light shines among mankind. You know, it shines at work. In your speech, in your actions. It shines in your, in your mailbox. What's your mailman bringing you in your mailbox? Your light shines when you get your mail. What come, what's coming in UPS? What's coming in your mailbox? Your light shining. Your light shining at work in your conversations. Coming back to this meaning of him brewing, we need to pure, pure, uh, permeate. We need to influence our culture around us. Yes, it's a great big world out here, but your world is your daily life. My world is in my daily life, where I go to work, where I reside, where I go shopping at, how I pay my bills, how I live for Christ. We need to permeate and influence. I love that definition. By dying, we need to die ourselves to change the culture around us. Young people, you need to know God exists. You know, it was funny. I was going down the road the other day. I was looking at trees. Going across the mountain where I live at, there's a big old, about three rows of oak trees on the side of a hill, right on the edge, just like right on the edge right here. You know, trees and roots, you deal with trees, David. You've seen tap roots and stuff, they dig, they dig down deep. You've probably seen the same thing I'm going to talk about. These trees be on the edge. They don't stick a root out there to nothing. They curl back to dirt. Then, then, then I noticed that oak tree, every root was curled back <laughs> in the dirt. The tree has life. God give it life. In my, uh, in my garage, there was a vine growing up in the back of the, of the wall of my garage. And I had one little tiny crack in my window. I didn't pay attention to it. It had a little stubble of vine coming through about like that. About a month later, it was about that long, attaching to my ceiling and leaves coming off of it. I could, I was like, wow! That little vine comes through that little hole of daylight and enough to realize that it's getting ready to fall so it snatches onto the wall and rides up the ceiling and comes across my ceiling. And people say there's no God. People say that's just... Science just say we've all come from a ball of pl plasma. Dirt. Big Bang. God gave it life. God spoke it all into existence. God knew you from creation. 
He knew you. He knew, young lady, he knew you was going to get up here and sing tonight. He knew. He created you with a voice. He created you. I don't even put you on the spot. I'm sorry. But it's just a testimony. God knew she was going to. God invented her with a voice, a talent. And she's using it for God. She's not using it for all this awful junk music out here. She's using it to sing for God. To give Jesus, her Savior, friend. I never heard that rendition of that song. That was very pretty. Revitalization. It starts at the church. It starts here. Not only with your pastor, it starts with you, members. It starts in your home. Does God need to revitalize something? Do you need to revitalize your relationship with Him? Have you been just bogged down? Feel like you may have met young people. Y'all go through stuff too. And you feel like you can't talk to us and talk about it. Because you think we're going to bark, bark, bark your head off. And as parents, I'm a parent. Sometimes I do bark. And then I gotta come back and tell Bella, I love her. Sorry I barked at you. Just sit down and talk about this. I'm so glad the young people are here tonight. You guys need to know from your parents that you come to them. Your grandparents. You need to know you can come to them about anything. You need to know how much they love you. You need to know how much God loves you. Most of all, they need to see it. The young people need to see it in the adults. They need to see it in all of us. So speaking of myself, what I don't, I don't preach, I don't preach to you, I don't preach to myself. God's God speaking to me too. Kids, that's what you don't realize. When you grow up, you won't know what your parents did until you have children of your own. They won't know. You won't. You don't know about the nights that your parents were on their knees praying for you, or watching you sleep, and just thanking God that you're healthy. Thanking God you're not out on the street, cutting up in the middle of the night. In places that you don't need to be. You need to thank your mom and daddy, your grandparents, that you got a place. Roof over your head, food to eat. Times that kids, the times that your parents is worried about you because they love you so much. times that God has showed up and showed out. I think of our little miracle boy, Christopher. Most of y'all may know his story. Six months old, he had to have cranial synopsis surgery. What it was is he was, when he was born, he was a coat. And it couldn't be corrected by a helmet. So they had to take his head and cut him a wavy incision from ear to ear and peel his head back and cut his skull and reshape his head. And to look at him, you couldn't tell it unless you cut his hair short enough where you see the skull. To look at his head, 
you couldn't tell he had something done. We've got a little spot back there that's been trying to heal for him two years. We get it healed and somehow he may scratch it or bump it and, and, and that sore shows back up. You don't have to be prayed over that. I look at it as a new testimony. That, that, that little fella, he's a he never meets a stranger. I'm not saying that because he's my son. Uh, not only is my son, but like Jen said, you know, he wore a little necktie to school yesterday. He didn't even match nothing. He wore it on a t-shirt. It was necktie day. He said, Mommy, I got to wear a necktie. Neckties. So he found a little necktie for him and put it on him. And he didn't match nothing. That teacher seen him come off the bus. She had to give him a big old hug. How, look how cute he was. That little necktie. But I didn't mean to go off on a rabbit trail. But we need to remember the times that God was there for us. That boy went through a 15, 16 hour service. It's supposed to be about a five or eight hour service. My God was there in the operating room. Because they say by chance his surgery blanket, whatever, they lay over you to isolate you. They put a blanket over you and just isolate one spot they're working on. And just by chance, his leg went off the side of the table. They say by chance, but it was God's grace. His leg was turning purple. And he had a blood clot in his leg. They had to track it down. So they had to stop his surgery on his head and come and get us get permission to do another surgery to find the blood clot. So they had to stop his surgery on his head, keep that sealed and isolated and clean while they find the blood clot. So once they corrected the blood clot and replenished his blood supply, he, he, he lost his blood supply. They had to replenish his whole body blood supply. And we realized God was with him. He defied all the odds. They said his eyes would be swollen for a week. He opened them in three days. Got out two days early. His projector. That's when my God showed up and showed out in our life. Those stories, we all have those stories. And we need to tell those stories. To our children at the time. You may not know, remember this, but I remember when God did this for you and you, you were sick and you didn't know it. But God did this. That's how they know God exists through our testimonies. Just like we permeate our, our existence, our Christianity, and our daily life. My pastor was talking about this last night. He used to worry about people not talking to him anymore or, or be uncomfortable they don't talk to him no more because of his belief or Christianity. He don't worry about that anymore. Sometimes we permeate our culture so much around us, people get, a cult, get, get uncomfortable. Just like we're the light of the world and you get dark people around you, if your light's shining so much for Christ, they will get uncomfortable around you. And they're going to walk away from you. Don't feel bad when they walk away. Just continue being the light for Christ. I'm like, honey, you just need to plug in and just listen. Just give it a shot. Give it a chance. All you young people, you're looking at me and paying attention. I'm so glad. Praise God for God. Some of y'all I haven't seen in a while. Either you grown up, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I see that. <laughs> jealous, man. It's different, but. <laughs> but those are things we need to pass down generation to generation on the board. Just like God told him here in Exodus 14, and this day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast in the ordinances forever. 
And while God's dealing with his people, he tells, tells them later, I think Exodus 17, if y'all just obey my statutes, he just told Moses and Aaron, the Israelites kept bitterly complaining to God. We have our times we complain to God. We complain. And just going through, we're going through this in Sunday school, that's why I know so much about this. We, we've gone through the whole book of Exodus, we're in like chapter 17 now. Word for word, study for study, precept upon precept. It's like every time God did something for them, they're fine for a couple days and then they complain. God separated the Red Sea that went through dry land, killed the Pharaoh and all of them. They, were, they, they sung praises. Mary had grabbed the tambourine and led them in like praise and worship. Read it. Led them in praise and worship. And then three days later, they were complaining because of no water. They were somewhere where it was bitter water. They complained to Moses. Well, we're better off back in Egypt. We had water. There. You're going to lead us out here in the wilderness to die? Read it. They complained to Moses. Told them they're better off back in Egypt. God told them to cast a piece of wood into the the, the spring of the bitter water and it turned it into sweet water. It turned it into nice water to drink. They're all happy. All of them drinking the water and they're happy. Then they go a few more days complaining. We're hungry. Moses, we were better off. We had cakes and things to eat in Egypt. We are better off back there. You leave us here to starve. What's God do? He describes man and quail. The man is described as like little plates laying under the own. Underneath the dew of the morning. Underneath the dew. Uh, Underneath the dew. The dew of the morning. You know when you go outside waiting for the bus, there you get your, your your feet wet, your shoes wet. That's dew on the ground from the humidity in things. And uh, God provided the manna, and God provided quail for them. Gave them command: take up what you need to eat just for the day. Don't take up too much. I'll make it rot. And evidently, some took up too much. And God made it right. Are you supposed to share or just keep enough for yourself? And then on the sixth day, he told them to take up enough for two days because the seventh day was a day of rest. And then later on, they complained and complained. And then, if you think about it, the Israelites are no different from us. We need revitalization. As I come to you this last Wednesday of the month, the revitalization month, I want to charge you this morning, this evening, folks. Revitalize your heart. Get down and get serious with God. If you slack, we, we've all been there, grown complacent. We've grown slack on things, areas in our life. I'm sure Brother Mike can testify. I know I can testify. We all have those downtime. We get so downtime. But we need to remember we're God's children. We're part of the kingdom. We're part of the heaven. We're going to heaven. Our soul is sealed from the, till the day of redemption. And the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, Christ died on this cross. And was resurrected. Resurrected. We serve a resurrected living Savior today, folks. And we're charging. Let's revitalize tonight. You, you all know where you stand with God. I can't answer for you. I can't answer for them. I can't answer for my wife. I can't, when my son reaches to the age of accountability and he knows right from wrong and knows there's a God, knows something that exists out here, I can't answer for Christopher. I can only answer for myself. You can only answer for yourself. You know if you truly are saved or not. Amen. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? Why would God let you 
you into his heaven tonight if you passed away? What would be your answer? You look the Savior in his face and he asked you, why should I let you in? What would be your answer? What would be your answer? We will stand, we will stand before him one day as Christians. We will stand and answer for. We will answer for every idle word we've ever said. We will answer for every action. Our works will be burnt. Either we have wood stay or humble, or we will have the jewels and the crowns and be able to stand that fire and refine it and be able to put it in Christ's feet. We will stand before a living Savior. We will stand before Him. The unsaved will stand before him in judgment. They will say, depart from me. He will say to them, depart from me. You work over the iniquity. I never knew you. Workers of the iniquity. And they say, if you read those scriptures, they say, well, we did all this for you. We, did, we prayed for people. We did this for you. Hey, people can teach a Sunday school class. No offense, no offense. People can teach a Sunday school class. And still be lost as a bad. People can sing a choir. People can play a piano. People can go out here. People, people can preach and be lost. There's people out here deceiving people with a false gospel. You've got to know the Bible to know the difference. To be able to discern from truth false. It's up to us to know God's word. To know his teachings, to, to, to know what's right and wrong. Let's close with word prayer. <coughs> Father God, I just feel you said that's enough. I've had to shut my mouth. I just pray right now. We will give a time of invitation. I'm going to go over there and shut my live stream on. This will be a private moment. It will not be seen live. Father, we just pray that you would um, have an encounter with each and every one of us. As we close out this revitalization month, let us lead revitalized community. Holy Spirit, work on our hearts. Teach us. Tell us what's going on. Tell us what's wrong. Give us conviction. Convict us, God. Tell us what's going on. Let us have an honest moment with you. Have an honest conversation. Let the youth sit there and have an honest conversation with you. Let the adults have an honest conversation. Do I really know Christ? Am I having a relationship with the living Savior? Am I in a relationship with the Father? Or do I just know him but don't know of him? As we turn the service back over to Pastor Mike.